OK, let's have a look at the return game with David Bronstein in the Blitz of 1970, the Herceg Novi, played in Yugoslavia. So e4 from David, and Fischer plays his usual Sicilian defence. And we see the dreaded c3 Sicilian. And I think this next move has a great deal to recommend it. I think it's the favourite move of most grandmasters nowadays against the c3 Sicilian. Knight f6. Borrowing a bit some ideas from the Alakine defence, uh, because here you know with this, with c3 white hasn't got the usual uh, knight c3 or he'd have to waste time playing c4, uh, so it's got a lot of perks over an Alakine defence. This move, e5 was played knight d5, so to kick the knight again would be another tempo loss. d4. Okay. Fisher takes on d4, and now we see queen takes d4. And the knight is actually protected there on d5, and we see knight f3, and the queen is kicked to e4. And I believe this is all kind of theoretical so far. Black aims to undermine the e5 pawn. d6. Knight bd2, and now bishop e7. And white enjoys a crude battery against h7, of course. Of course, he's dislodged the knight away from defending h7. So bishop d3, black doesn't want a castle here, and an our mate. He undermines the center. He plays d takes e5. And structurally now, we have a situation where black has potentially uh, an extra pawn in the center uh, to try and get his central pawn mass moving forward. So look out for that here. Uh, for the moment though, after knight takes e5, queen takes e5, white enjoys pressure on that semi-open e-file and the e5 square can be used uh, for an outpost as we're about to see. So bishop c2, for the moment bishop d6 and now it seems after queen h5 uh, a move which looks a bit naughty here was played Okay, crudely eyeing h7. Fish is not going to fall for the mate in one, but how is he going to defend it? If he plays g6, would that be adequate, adequate or would it be inviting queen h6? Let's just engine check this position. Maybe indeed what was played was the best move. Perhaps so, yes. So g6 might actually be technically inferior on very brief analysis here to f5. f5 apparently is stronger on brief, brief analysis. Uh, rather than g6. g6, queen e2, we're looking at stuff like knight c4, knight e5, okay. Don't want to weaken the dark squares in principle with a move like g6. But f5 has its own issues potentially. Can white lock down on the e5 square in this semi open file? He plays knight f3, which sort of sacrifices the bishop pair now because after knight f4, uh, you know, g2 is attacked as well as the queen. The queen uh, has nowhere to move, in fact, uh, to avoid g2 loss. If it goes to like queen g5, then takes and then knight g2 might be good. So David gives up his bishop pair with bishop takes f4, but he's going to get an iron grip soon on the e5 square. Off the g6, queen h3. Queen f6, black seems to be contesting the e5 square here. Rook a d1. And you see a problem with this bishop. You know, if it if it goes too quickly on one of these diagonals, then you know rook d7 is waiting, and then h7 again is on in the firing line. I know there's stuff like rook f7, but even so. So black has to be careful. He plays b6 anyway. After rook f e1. You know, Black's not careful. Um, if he's not careful, you know, if he plays e5 too quickly, then g3 might be really embarrassing uh, here. Or bishop b3 check might be actually quite useful as well. But basically, g3 and uh, that looks pretty, pretty dangerous. Let's have a quick check here. In fact, I think uh, maybe just taking and taking on e5 though. So maybe no need, to, no need to check that. G3 looks strong there. King h8. So we have a problem here that this bishop doesn't really want to move for rook d7s. We also have this other problem that white has strong semi open file pressure. 
and and control basically of of um, the e5 square for a moment, which he's going to try and reinforce, and he does so soon with g3, which is a prelude uh, to soon playing in the game f4. Well, f4 comes a few moves later. Queen h6 now threatens potentially knight g5 could be useful. Again, this bishop doesn't want to move because of rook d7s particularly. Um, so here, queen g7 inviting the exchange of queens. But white is left with control of e5 here. This queen was helping to fend e5, but now the king comes in pretty soon to help control uh, the e5 square. But after this move, there is a pin, a virtual pin on this e pawn, which could have been pounced on actually. Knight d4 was played here, which looks quite good, uh, putting more pressure on e6 for sure. So the king comes in, but it was at this moment when this pin uh, gave white a tactical opportunity here. Intuitively, you know, he wants to restrain uh, black from playing e5. So a lockdown with f4 is very, very tempting and attractive. So f4 was the move played, but actually tactically, if you engine check this, you'll find engines like bishop d5, just using the pin and uh, attacking the rook. And if rook b8, now knight c6, and you know, white's pieces are getting aggressive. Knight b4 attacking the rook at leisure. And now the bishop can come back here. And this is an uncomfortable position for black. But is it necessarily winning for white? Uh, let's get the engine view here. It's it's nearly technically a pawn up. Let's, let's give a move like rook f8. How is white actually making progress? Maybe he, if he wants, he can reroute the knight with tempo all the time. Knight b5 looks a bit of a menace. Maybe he can nick a pawn. So it seems uncomfortable anyway. We get the gist that it was actually uncomfortable, this position. But uh, it seems now, if we go back to the game continuation, f4, that now Fisher plays a6, which at least actually gives his rook a7, uh, potentially, uh, which might be handy. Um, but again, it seems, you know, is, is bishop d5 actually playable again here? Or can white increase the lockdown on e5? Is it playable here in this position? It might be a good move still. Maybe rook a7 isn't that hot because again it runs into knight c6 and big deal. So in this position it looks as though again white can torture black with these tempo gains and maybe have a comfortable position after say bishop f3. Comfortable position. All right, so remember it's only a five minute game though so let's not take this game too seriously. Knight f3 keeps the lockdown on e5 or does it? If Fisher can resolve this lockdown he's, he can get these two to one you know pawns in the center crashing down and I think it's kind of instructive how he liberates his center now after rook e7 white plays h4 uh, even before black has any thought of playing h6 and g5 but Fisher plays for h6 and g5 nonetheless he plays h6 because he really wants to undermine white's control of e5 here King f2, and now at leisure, of course, he can play. Because his king's now protecting, of course, e7. This tactic has vanished now. The king's protecting e7, by the way. Um, so king f2, bishop b7. And the bishop's on a very fine diagonal. So Fisher's definitely coming back into the game. Unless, you know, this knight on e5 is actually doing something quite functional. Um, but for the moment, after rook a8, Okay, the rooks are piled behind this pawn, which isn't going anywhere, and is locked down by white quite aggressively. There seems to be a lockdown, but can black liberate the position? He has got the bishop pair. Can he make his pawn center mobile? That's the big question. A4, carrying on a kind of lockdown policy, uh, maybe to discourage like B5. But now G5, and here it starts to get a bit unpleasant because there are already ideas like of taking 
and then maybe rook g8 and coordinate pressure of the, of the bishop and rook. So it seems you know white is potentially losing control of this position. But surely you might ask, can the, can white use the h file? No, it's difficult with that long range bishop to to use the h file. Hg hg, and white loosens his control of the center here. He plays actually f takes g5. So these pawns are really going to become mobile after this. Did White have a choice here? Let's just quickly check this position. Apparently, okay, Black's doing okay in this position. Um, maybe, okay, same move like Bishop C4 and even Knight D7 check. Should should White be in trouble here? F takes G5. Then maybe taking on e6. It looks as though it was about equal technically. For if if both players are playing with clinical precision, which they're not going to be, uh, like computers, then then white was okay. But in the game continuation, now we see a liberation of black center pawns after king takes. Uh, rook d4 looks like a resourceful idea with this access route to, to the h file. Let's play rook h4 has caused uh, some problems. Rook h7, check, and now rook h4, guarding that h file. An exchange, and now g takes h, and now both pawns have no resistance really, with this pawn out of the picture as well. And look how, how Fisher uses his center pawns here. They come crashing through. Off to h5, e4, knight d4. They just they just push forward here, perhaps a little bit too optimistically. Um, after check, sorry, after rook g1, now check. And here, okay, bishop e4, which seems to guard against, for example, rook g6 check. Uh, now we see bishop c2. And it looks as though actually White could have significantly improved his play because here he ends up losing a piece because of f3 check. Uh, because taking here is now a discovered check on his king. And he can't do anything really much else with his king without these pawns uh, slaughtering him in this position. If he plays, for example, now king d1, then f2, the pawns are really crashing through, uh, for example, like this just winning uh, easily. Uh, so basically from this point on it seems white is dead lost now actually because after check he, he's basically just lost the piece and it's, it seems dead lost. Uh, but there was a point of, of salvation if we just rewind but first at move 43 let's just follow this for a, a piece up just to see a blockade of the H pawn stopping white using the G7 square and now targeting that h6 pawn. He's about to munch it. Okay. And then David Bronstein had enough here. So uh, Fisher won this game here. But uh, even in this position with the mobile pawns, if we just move, move back here, I think there was an opportunity uh, for White to do better uh, here than, than what was played. Um, h5 or maybe for black to do much better rather if if black had played he played e4 which seems very natural to move the pawns forward but apparently rook h8 and maybe you know there's no problem with this pawn is it dropping off uh, a way of protecting it would would fail miserably surely rook h1 would fail miserably to e4 and then e3 check and then you just take the rook so maybe this is why rook h8 is so powerful here. That's not one um, observation from, from mention checking earlier this game. Rook h8 might be the most powerful. But e4 is also pretty strong actually. It's come up as as, e, as almost as strong. Just moving these, these center pawns straight away. Okay. But again, rook h8 again here is also dangerous because white can never play rook h1 as a v3 check. But f4 is played, which is also, it seems strong, but you look at the evaluation shift. Technically, okay, did white have a resource here? He played rook g1, and we saw e3 check. 
And then we saw bishop e4 protecting g6. So maybe bishop c2 is the big howler here. Uh, white has, for example, rook g8 or bishop c4. Now rook g8, if we follow through with rook g8, what is rook g8 doing? It's not minding the exchange of rooks there. And white still has that asset of the h pawn. So if he can get h6, h7, that's going to be quite dangerous. The king is kind of blockading these pawns. So this doesn't look to be a massive advantage actually for black objectively. Isn't that interesting how one, one move there and it doesn't actually look as helpless at all uh, for white. But what he played was a big howler, bishop c2. And after f3, black is crashing through. So that's that's a bit of a shame for David, I guess. Um, this game, but um, definitely, I think in 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 the game we just saw previous to this, he had tons of counterplay with black. But here it seems uh, Fisher's task in this game was to break the binds, and once he broke the binds and got the central pawns, the chances were all in his favour for those pawns crashing through like they did. But uh, yeah, clinical precision. This idea of rook g1, rook g8 seems very good to leave uh, quite a secure blockade it seemed with, with just the king um, so with the rooks on the board that that uh, central pawn majority uh, was a lot more dangerous if you if you look at that with one pair of rooks on the left on the board here um, it makes this central pawn majority more dangerous uh, especially in the context of a five minute game uh, well, especially because f3 is just winning uh, straight off the bat as well. Um, now you might think actually just just f we didn't actually cover king f1 here. Just just a moment for that. King f1. Sorry, king, king e1 is f2 check. King f1. All oh, right, there's a crushing move, bishop h2, but also f2, just the natural f2, and then again e2 check. Would be good. Say the rook moves here, then e2 check, and then if knight takes, bishop takes c2, and if bishop takes, bishop takes check, and if king takes, then okay, you can still win a piece with check here, and then then get this discovered check. So, or even just win the rook here in this in this case, even stronger with bishop f3 or bishop f5. So. Okay, okay. It's it's a five-minute game. It had some very interesting properties uh, to it. Uh, it seems, yeah, Fisher had most of the dynamism of this game. Uh, I think you've got to hand it to him here. That he broke the bind, uh, the the blockade, the you know the e5 control. He played very resourcefully to break that bind. And uh, okay, a great game. Five-minute chess. Uh, very high quality. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.